Mr. Howard, ladies and gentlemen. No, I won't say it. Okay, we now come to the vexed question as to whether Prime Minister John Howard is best described as a Liberal or a Conservative. Of course, for some of his critics, including Robert Mann, Donald Horne and Guy Rundle. Why didn't you ever invite Guy Rundle, uh, Tom? Uh, Howard was not worthy of being granted such lofty appellations. Rundle saw him purely as an opportunist. John Howard sought to establish the principles on which the Liberal Party is founded. He has claimed that the Liberal Party is a broad church that brings together the liberalism of John Stuart Mill and the conservatism of Edmund Burke. There are a number of dimensions to this claim. Is it a serious attempt to elucidate an intellectual foundation for the Liberal Party and its policies? What exactly is meant by the terms liberal and conservative in the Australian context? And why are these terms represented by a British and an Irish thinker? How is it possible to apply terms such as liberal and conservative to the actions of a politician or government as opposed to its public image? The adoption of the idea of the Liberal Party as a broad church, as the party of John Stuart Mill and Edmund Burke, can be seen as a response to the changed political landscape created by both the reforms of Hawke and Keating in Australia and the demise of communism in the Soviet Union and uh, Eastern Europe. The Liberal Party could no longer describe itself in those new circumstances as an anti-socialist party. It is worth recalling that it was George Reid who first defined the then Liberal Party, the original one, as being anti-socialist, as he attempted to bring together protectionist and free trade liberals together in opposition to the emerging Labor Party. Such a move made sense in the decade of the Australian settlement, but no longer resonated in the 1990s. One of John Howard's great achievements was to create a new image of the Liberal Party by stamping it as the party of John Stuart Mill and Edmund Burke. I don't think this stamp was very deep philosophically, but it did resonate with the party faithful. After Whitlam, the Labor Party slowly shed its conservative skin in its quest to become a socially progressive party. And I think Howard instinctively understood that if the Liberals could put on that skin, they could also attract those who were repulsed by socially progressive liberalism. There is an irony here. Menzies had expanded the universities in part because he believed that he was creating an additional white collar constituency for the Liberal Party. The accidents of history, including Corwell's narrow loss in 1961 and the coming of Whitlam as a messiah, allowed Labor to cast off its ingrained social conservatism. And if you're looking for real social conservatism, you should read Arthur Corwell. Um, and to become the party of progressive liberalism. As I've argued elsewhere, this enabled Whitlam to become an apostle of what can be described as a sort of modern form of million liberalism. Howard's broad church formulation allowed the liberals to reclaim Mill as a liberal but with his progressive and radical elements shorn off. By pairing Mill and Burke, he was able to formulate what is essentially a new form of liberal conservatism, uh, which was a term, interestingly enough, that was created in 19th century British colonies, uh, including Canada and Australia. Given the circumstances of the Liberal Party in the 1990s, I think it was essential. The formulation of the broad church, however, was not meant, I think, to be a statement of how the Liberals would govern, such as John Hewson had attempted with Fightback. Fightback was a failure because it was too dogmatic, setting out what looked like a libertarian plan that was designed to transform Australia. It could be portrayed as an attack on Australian values. Invoking Mill and Burke gave a good pedigree to the Liberal Party, even if that pedigree came from, down, came from outside Australia. It also made it appear to be a party based on sound political principles. This is somewhat at odds with many traditional understandings of liberalism in Australia. Wishing to be seen as conservative was really something quite new in Australian politics. And of course, Menzies uh, always said that he had founded a liberal party. It has always been unclear what being liberal in Australia actually means. 
at various stages, it has been associated with notions of good government. Uh, certainly one can find statements like that uh, from Menzies. Certainly, 19th century Australian liberals held John Stuart Mill in very high regard. As, interestingly enough, did um, the Labor, the then Labor figure, Billy Hughes, in the case for Labor. He is the only liberal thinker invoked by Sir Robert Menzies in The Forgotten People. The only political thinker in Australia who consistently cited Mill was Bruce Smith, who can be considered a politician who failed because he was too ideological. But then Smith, interestingly enough, also cites Burke 50 times in Liberty and Liberalism, including on the title page. Leaving aside Smith, liberalism in Australia has found very few systematic expositions and is often mixed up with a number of other ideas and, and beliefs. One can see this quite clearly in the Constitution Conventions debates of the 1890s when many of the participants went out of their way so that they could not be accused of theorising. Menzies may refer to Mill in The Forgotten People, but this work is far from being based on the ideals of theoretical liberalism. The most striking aspect of this work is his evocation of family and home. With Menzies, as with earlier liberals, there is a set of embedded and implicit values, values that often go under the radar when discussing the role of political ideas in Australia. Owing to the increasing abstract quality of our political culture, we attempt to subsume these values under the heading of some political ideology or other, regardless of its appropriateness. My argument is quite simple. If we are to understand John Howard's liberalism and conservatism, we need to appreciate the sorts of what can be described as subterranean values. The problem with terms such as liberalism and conservatism is they tend to obscure such values under an abstract universality. As with Menzies, reading Howard's speeches, and here the two speeches which I'm particularly concerned with are the 2004 and 2007 election speeches, are difficult to understand if a liberal and or conservative template are imposed on them. The word liberty does not appear in either speech. The word freedom, which was Menzies' preferred term, uh, just as Dad Rudd, MP, invoked freedom in his maiden speech in his, the 1940 movie. Has anyone seen Dad Rudd, MP? Oh, that's a pity. Um, uh, appears seven times in the 2004 speech, but not at all in 2007. Individual as a noun appears in both speeches, but generally in conjunction with the word family. The word family appears in both speeches, while the word, word home, which appears 21 times in Menzies' Forgotten People speech, is used 15 times in 2004, and 23 times in 2007. In these speeches, there are some interesting connections between family, home, and small business. So I just want to give two extracts, one from 2004, one from 2007. A belief that the family is the greatest source of emotional support and inspiration that an individual can ever have. As the son of a small business owner, an unshakable belief in the role of dynamic small business as an engine of economic progress and personal fulfillment, a passionate belief in flexible workplaces free of rigidity in the industrial system and unwanted union interference. Our commitment to small business is strong, consistent and enduring, but so of course is our commitment to the Australian family, an unshakable belief that it really is the centre of the life of the nation and a belief that the role of government is not to tell parents how to bring up their children, not to tell parents that they, where they should be educated, not to tell parents whether one or other should be at home full time when the children are young. Small business are the heart and soul of Australian economy. There are 1.2 million of them, employing almost 3.5 million Australians. They are dynamic. Many small businesses are started by women. Many operate from home. They represent the new face of innovative Australia. 
the new face of entrepreneurial Australia. And here's a quote from 2007. That was a single quote, by the way, not cut apart. Families are the building blocks of a good society and the policies that we've developed over the last 11 and a half years, the family tax benefits, the baby bonus and many others, have supported families at every stage of life, expanding the horizons of their choices. Evidence from around the world shows that a culture of saving and home ownership, even among families on modest incomes, is associated with an orientation towards the future, household stability, stable marriages, steady employment, educational attainment, healthy lifestyles and local civic involvement. This is the essence of the opportunity society I want Australia to become, where people are encouraged to work hard, save and look after their families and contribute to their communities. In addition, capital gains tax will be removed for Australians who share equity in a family member's first home. The home being an almost sacred part of the Australian liberal creed stretches back to Menzies' memorable evocation of homes material, homes human and homes spiritual in the forgotten people's speech of 1942. And what unites our crowd, creed of optimism is the belief the Australian people do not need government instructing them about virtue. They are more than capable of charting their own course towards a good life for themselves and for their families. Now, I think Howard was absolutely correct to make the connection between the vision of a small business Australia one second, and the desire and, oh, sorry, that, that revolved around the family with Menzies' forgotten people. The linkage between family, home and a desire to be self-sufficient and not dependent on anyone else is a central aspect of a traditional Australian way of thinking. It is a desire that has deep roots that lay at the centre of what might be termed the Australian dream of a republic of small property owners. There is a contrast here between the rhetoric of the broad church, largely pitched at the level of rhetoric and ideology, and the subterranean tradition of political values that motivate what can be described as the utopian hopes of large numbers of Australians. Howard's utopian moment, I think, comes very late in his prime ministership after the 2004 election, and it comes in the shape of work choices. Howard admits the control of the Senate, granted to his government in 2004, was unexpected and an accident of history. Fortuna perhaps had smiled on him, and he had a once in generation opportunity to do something. Not only, <clears throat> not only that, but it could perhaps be construed that Providence had granted Australia the great gift of prosperity. I have argued elsewhere that there have been three utopian moments in Australia. The move to redistribute land in the 1850s and 1860s through free selection. The Deaconite settlement of the early 20th century with its emphasis on a new province for law and order and modest comfort. And what can be described as the education revolution of the last 30 years. John Howard, I think, was no supporter of the second or third utopian movements. He was opposed to the Deaconite moment because it institutionalised union power through its use of the courts to create, create industrial peace. Liberal critics of arbitration, such as Elton Mayo, criticised it because it suppressed organic relationships between employer and employee and reduced all conflict within a workplace to a matter of wages and conditions. Underpinning such critiques was, I believe, belief that the artificial interventions into society do not allow for the development of the natural and harmonious relationships between people. Howard is not an educational utopian, unlike Sir Robert Menzies, who believes strongly in the capacity of education to create a better world. Educational utopianism, which focuses very heavily on the universities, which is absolutely now totally rampant in this country, was subsequently stolen for the Labor, pa Labor Party. It is the utopianism of the educated elites. I think Howard's utopianism goes back to the sorts of impulses that led to the various land acts of the colonial period. The dream of the land acts was a social order of small producers who would live together in villages composed of families and create harmonious social order. A similar vision inspired Bob Santa Maria and his dream of an Australia composed of rural Catholic villages nearly a hundred years later. It also informed the Australian suburban dream and the desire to be independent as the owner of a small business and where one could raise one's family. 
Howard's version of this in utopian impulse can be described perhaps as a sort of social liberal distributism. The role of government is to establish the conditions under which families and small businesses can thrive. Understood in this way, work choices makes perfect sense as the removal of those impediments which would prevent the natural operation of human relationships. So what does this mean? Imposing a liberal and conservative template on Australian political thought can be somewhat misleading, especially if these modes of politics are viewed through an American and or English lens. Secondly, there are other sorts of ideas, many subterranean, that have influenced politics in Australia. These include distributism, traditionalist republicanism, and a faith in what is best described as rough justice. My conclusion is that the terms liberal and conservative have their uses both in political rhetoric and for academics seeking to reduce complexity to simple models, but tend to obscure the sorts of values and impulses that lead to action in the real world. We all have utopian impulses, and Australians, I, I, you may find it strange I'm saying Australians are utopian. I think there's strong utopian impulses in Australia. Uh, even those of us who claim to be the mantle of conservatism. In the somewhat extraordinary circumstances following the 2004 election, the opportunity arose for John Howard to put some of these utopian pro, pro impulses on display. I think they are far more revealing in explaining his actions than anything to do with the idea of the broad church. Thank you. So Greg, the description of some members of the Liberal Party, including parliamentarians, as the wets and the dries does not easily equate with the Liberals and the Conservatives, does it? No, not necessarily, no. I mean, uh, the, the, the point is, the point is that, that, the point is that Liberalism in Australia, when I approached this to do this, I thought, well, what does actually Liberalism mean? So I mentioned Bruce Smith. The other significant Liberal philosophy thinker in Australia, of course, is Frederick Eggleston. Now, Eggleston called himself a Liberal, uh, and he said, oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Liberal. Uh, that means I'm a Fabian Socialist. I thought, that's interesting, uh, which means that the Liberalism stretches can be stretched so far that, that it almost becomes meaningless. So using terms like liberal conservative are real problematic. I think it's, what I've done a little taste there is if you actually look at the, the political, some of the language that's used, you can actually get other sorts of things coming out. Um, and that's, I think, which, which, interesting enough with the thing that, which links John Howard and, and, and Menzies. Uh, Menzies. Menzies, the use of home, that's something which I think is, is continuous. But in an American or another sense, I don't know if that's liberalism, because I, I say liberalism has nothing to do with individuals and liberty. So what is it then? It's, I think it's something else. I, I, I don't know if I mentioned pay. I almost see what I see here is a, uh, a society of small producers, uh, small businesses. That's, that's, and I think there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole set of ideas around small business which are good, uh, which tend to be crowded out. And they get crowded out because academics, for example, have no understanding of what it means to be a small business person. Yeah. And why should they? And why no. should they? they? They live in this bureaucratic nightmare that... Uh... <laughs> as Tony Jones would say, I'll take that as a statement, not a question. <laughs> um, but is, though, there something significant in the fact that, in terms of its philosophical home, mm. the Liberal Party would look more to Victoria, or at least that's their uh, presumption, uh, you might say it's their pretension, whereas New South Wales has not produced the same kinds of intellectual uh, theorists of liberalism. Um, it's an interesting thought. Uh, there, of course, there's a big debate about Bruce Smith, uh, about whether he's a Victorian or a New South Welshman, but um, uh, no, no, I mean, the, the, the level of theoretical writing is not high, and I think there's a reason for that, which is that, that the, as I mentioned about the, the, the people who wrote the Constitution, uh, high levels of theory are not part of Australian political culture. <clears throat> because of the sense. leaders or because of the lead? In other words, what's the point of doing high political philosophy if most of the people 
applying their pub test go, I have no idea what any of this means. Is it that? (sighs) Well, pub test, I suppose it's a pub test. Um, I mean, I mean, you've got to, I don't want to get sort of into theories of knowledge and so on, but you've got to look at the sorts of people who develop, who develop theories. They're, they're often not ordinary working people, yes. Yeah, I suppose I'm thinking about when they said Kim Beasley was prolix, that, um, and no one knew what that word till Kim Beasley became it, but um, that kind of thing where, you know, oh, this person is able to speak the language of the person who's standing in the front bar mm. of the whatever hotel. So part of the pub test is not just is it truthful or not, but do I get it or not? Yeah. And so I'm wondering whether or not these distinctions, do they actually have any value in the electorate? Um, well, the, the, I think the broad church with the Liberal and Conservative probably doesn't have much value in the electorate, but it was extremely good for the Liberal Party because it helped to redefine what the Liberal Party was. So it's more internal strategic communications. I think so. I think so. Than, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, perhaps comments, questions? Um, Tim Rouse. Sorry. Greg, Greg, would you agree that since, I'm not sure, perhaps certainly since the 90s, the Liberal Party has had a lot of difficulty with the term multiculturalism? And if you do agree with that, do you have an explanation? Ah. Well, they didn't have problems. So what you're suggesting, they didn't have problems with it under Malcolm Fraser and that at a later stage. I, 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 I think that... Again, multiculturalism is a term that is bandied around, but it's awfully hard to get a, give a meaning to it. Um, you know, it's like trying to to do, deal with rubbery things. It's a it's a general term that's used ideologically. Um, so they whether they 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 may have they may have problems, but I think a lot of people have problems with it. Is how I go. Sorry. It's used in the pubs. It's used in the pubs. Mm. Affirmatively. <coughs> Affirmatively? Mm. So which pubs should I go every, to? Every, every survey done about whether people support multiculturalism in Australia since the 70s, the majority is do. Yeah. Now, I'm sure they need different things by it, but it will pass your pub test about people giving it some, uh, having some understanding of the journey, even if their understandings were quite distant. Yeah, I, I'm not too sure what they're giving, what, what exactly they're, what, again, we don't, do we know what they actually mean when they're saying, yeah, so it's a bit like saying when people say they're liberal or conservative or social democrat, do they really know what they mean? Sorry? No, I mean, I, I, I suspect what they... I suspect what they probably mean by it is, yeah, I'm quite happy to get on with people who come from different backgrounds. But whether that's what multiculturalism means is a different issue. I mean, the other way to avoid it, and was used to avoid it, was to call the policy ethnic affairs. And I know that, you know, Philip Ruddock had policies which were called the ethnic affairs policies because it overcame that. It was to do with new arrivals. I I can be very mischievous. Um, John Howard adopted the term multiculturalism when we called it Australian multiculturalism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but see, what we're seeing here is the terms actually matter yeah. in yeah. ways that perhaps oh, we're not yeah. very clear about. Yeah, the, the, the terms matter in ways that yeah, we're not clear about. Because um, Pauline Hanson would say, oh, it's multiculturalism, not, oh, it's ethnic affairs as I recall it. But when Pauline Hanson uses it for her constituency, it means something different than what it means when you're talking in the pub. Well, it may or may not. Sorry? It may or may not. We do know her constituency is rich. For her constituency, it's a boo word. And for most people, it's not. But whether they have different understandings of it, I don't know. Other questions or comments, please? So just give me the short version. John Howard, conservative or liberal, question mark, what do I take away from your talk? 
John How oh, I'll, I'll, I'll say it this way. John Howard is, in a sense, a liberal in the same way that Sir Robert Gordon Menzies was a liberal. Uh, but that's a peculiarly Australian thing, uh, which, if you use a sort of ideological concept of liberal that comes from, say, the United States, uh, would be quite different. So it's, if it's a liberal, it's a local manifestation, but as I said, it, it may not measure up to an international standard of liberalism. Right, so we'd need to check the footnote on that particular ah. reference. Anyway, please thank Greg Malewish for his presentation.